Have you ever uh, <clears throat> been watching uh, television, maybe uh, a famous person, uh, or just or, or some, a reporter maybe, and they're asking some questions, and you wonder what's really going on in their mind? You wonder what somebody's really thinking? Or maybe a friend, and they're smiling at you and telling you all these things, but inside you're wondering what are they really thinking about me, or what are they, what are they, are they even thinking, are they just talking without thinking? Uh, the private thoughts of somebody, you've kind of wondered what's going on, you know, behind the face, which is like a mask, you know, it's just, it's just flesh, right? But then you've got the brain back there, and, and oh, this is off track, but uh, one of the presidential candidates, he's African American, and he, he's a brain surgeon, and he said something neat this week. He said, I operate on people's brains. He said, the skin color and the hair doesn't make the person. He says he knows what makes the person. It's right on the inside. Right? We're, our soul is looking through our mind, right? And so get past the, the face mask. You wonder, what's going on on the inside? And then sometimes you think, well, I don't think I can know what's going on in their head because I don't really think they know what's going on in their head. You know, they're, they seem pretty confused. Maybe we're not even sure of our own motivations. Why, do I, why did I just do that? That's not who I am. That's not who I want to be. That's not like me, or maybe it is because I've done it again. Why, on the inside, private thoughts that are too deep even for ourselves to discern? What moves somebody? Like, what, what brings joy to their heart? What brings a little enthusiasm to their step, brings brightness to their eyes? What shocks this person? What really upsets this person? Some folks have a good mask, right? You don't know what's going on in the inside. Deep down inside, what pleases them? Today we're going to get a chance to do that with uh, Jesus Christ, our Lord, our Savior. We say, I love you, Jesus, right? All Christians say, I love you, Jesus. But how can we know who he is? Or are we just loving some image that we've made up in our own mind? Well, that's why we're so thankful for this love letter from God. That's what the Bible really is. It's a love letter from God. He reveals to us his heart like, I don't want you guys committing adultery. I don't want you stealing. I don't want you telling lies. I mean, he gives us his heart right here about how his children should behave. Then he shows us his heart by actually coming down, God setting aside all his glory, all his power. He's born as a baby. How humble is that? And he washes his disciples' feet. How humble is that? The one who made all the galaxies in this giant universe comes to this little dust, piece of dust in the cosmos, this little piece of dust in the universe, and, he, and we've got such monstrous egos, and we're always getting upset, and our pride is wounded, and we're holding on to grudges. And the greatest one of all comes down. And he says, now here's the way I want you to do it. Wash each other's feet. Care for one another. Have genuine concern for one another. I'm so thankful that we get an insight into who God is. Otherwise, it'd just be me spouting some hot air, you spouting some hot air, and people said, well, I don't think God would really, well, and you know this because, or I don't think God would really, and how, how do you know that? How could you possibly know that? But if God loved us enough, if at the center of the universe it's all about love, That God created us out of love. He wants to love us. Our sin has taken us away from him. That's what the cross is all about. He died there because he loves us. He wants to bring us back to him. If the center of the universe is love, we shouldn't be surprised that God loved us enough to say, I don't want you to be worried if there's a heaven or a hell. I want to tell you. I don't want you to be worried, how can I get there? I'm going to tell you, have faith in me. If at the center of the universe is love, we should not be surprised that God himself would give us a love letter. So today's title is called A Glimpse into the Heart and Mind of God. A Glimpse into the Heart and Mind of God. Of course, we could probably title any study from the Bible that way. Uh, God is so wonderful, so kind to us that he'd actually show us these things in the scriptures. But uh, specifically today, I want us to look at, uh, from Luke chapter 7, Luke chapter 7, and we're going to read the first 10 verses about the faith of a a Roman centurion. The Romans had their army divided up into different groups, and one of the groups was called uh, 
One of the leaders of a group of 100 men was called a centurion. Like a century means 100 years. He's a centurion because he would have, if his force was up to full strength, he'd have 100 soldiers. Sometimes it was, of course, uh, less than that. But a centurion would be the leader of 100 soldiers. And there's some dispute because people are wondering why would Roman soldiers have been in Judea. And uh, that's a funny thing, that 2,000 years later, people would say, well, the people at that time said there's Roman soldiers there garrisoned, but we know that could never be. Uh, why would we think we would know better than the people that were actually there at that time uh, who wrote these things down? And so it was a complex situation. Judea was being ruled by one of Herod's sons, right? We, taught, we studied about those, Herod, a bunch of sons ruling different parts. But Rome ruled the whole region. And so even though there was a, a, a Herod in charge of that region, it shouldn't be surprising to us that there was a Roman garrison there as well. So let's read now Luke chapter 7, and we're going to look at the first 10 verses. We're, today we're going to get about halfway through, or about a third of the way through, I guess, chapter 7. But let's start with the first 10 verses. And we just had finished talking about the wise and foolish builders. Remember, Jesus said, if you hear my words, and you don't just hear them, but you put them into practice, there's, there's a blessing for you. And we talked about some blessings God gives to everybody in the world. They don't have to believe in them. Some blessings are for everybody. The blessings of flowers, of sunshine, of trees, the, the, the sound of a baby's voice. These blessings everybody gets to experience. And then there's, there's a blessing uh, for faith. When you come to God and say, God, I confess my sins. I know I'm a, a messed up person. <laughs> Lord, please forgive me. You get the blessing of eternal life. You get the blessing of complete forgiveness. But there are other blessings that are actually contingent upon our obedience, upon our behavior. Uh, you decide not to go to church ever, you don't get the bliss, blessing of being with God's people. You don't get the blessing of, of being with God's people when we pray, when we sing, when we study the word. Uh, you you want to go out and, and uh, start cheating somebody, you don't get the blessing of peace in your heart because you're doing things God's way. So some blessings are actually contingent upon our behavior. And Jesus said there's wise builders and foolish builders. He's talking about how you do your life. A foolish builder... He just puts up his house willy-nilly. It's like putting your house on the beach when the, when the tide is out to sea. Then when the tide comes in, the storm comes in, what happens? The house just washes away. But he said, if you hear my words, Jesus said, the things that I'm teaching, and you put them into practice, it's like finding solid, it's like finding bedrock. And then you build your house on that rock. You build your life. And so that's where we got the name of our church, Foundation Bible Church, a place to build your life. We're building our house. Uh, uh, you know, on the Word of God, our lives on the Word of God. Also, Christ is our rock, solid rock. We're building our life on Jesus Christ. So, verse seven, uh, chapter 7, verse 1 says, When Jesus had finished teaching all the things we just spoke about uh, to the people who were listening, he entered Capernaum. There a centurion's servant, whom his master valued highly, was sick and about to die. So the centurion is not a Jew, right? He's a, he's a, a Roman citizen. The centurion heard of Jesus and sent some elders of the Jews to him, asking him to come and heal his servant. So this is interesting. Uh, here we have the Jewish people who are occupied. They're occupied by this Roman army. They should have been hostile. The centurion, uh, Rome, looked down at this region, Palestine, they called it. The Romans were looking down at, at, at the people in Palestine. The Jewish people were very rebellious, very difficult for Rome to rule. But here we have a Roman centurion and Jewish elders and their friends. They, they get along well. They're acquaintances, uh, good acquaintances. So the centurion heard of Jesus, and he decides to send some Jewish elders to him, and he asks him, please come and heal my servant. When they came to Jesus, they pleaded earnestly with him. So they're not just carrying out a mission. Hey, the Roman centurion over there is bozo, is giving us a message. No, they plead with him earnestly. This man deserves to have you do this because he loves our nation and has built our synagogue for us. So Jesus went with them. Isn't that neat? Here's a Roman centurion. He's a Gentile, but he sees there's truth in these Old Testament scriptures. Remember, the New Testament's not written yet. He sees there's, tru there's truth in the God of Israel. He sees there's truth in the God of Israel, and he helps to build a synagogue with his own money. So Jesus went with them. He was not far from the house when the centurion sent friends to him to say, Lord, don't trouble yourself, for I do not deserve you 
to come underneath my roof. And maybe he knew that devout Jews wouldn't step into the home of a Gentile. And so he's trying to save Jesus from that. He's thankful that Jesus is coming, but he says, you don't actually have to come into my house. That is why I did not even consider myself worthy to come into your presence. But say the word, and I know my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority with soldiers under me. I tell this one, go, and he goes, and that one, come, and he comes. I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. So he has confidence that all Jesus has to do is say the word, and his servant will be healed. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed at him. And turning to the crowd following him, he said, I tell you, I have not found such great faith even in Israel. And you know what? How, many, how popular do you think that made him with his Jewish followers? What if the United States were being occupied by Red China or being occupied by Iran? I mean, something. I mean, we're talking hypothetical here. And somebody says, wow. Now, it has to be a true believer, but this person has more faith than the people in this neighborhood. How do you think that'd go over? Or, or I say, wow, people in Beloit really have faith, but Janesville people? Uh, Jesus, we're getting a glimpse into the heart and mind of God here, God in flesh, Jesus Christ. Uh, he's speaking truth here, and he's not there just to pat people in the back and make himself popular. He says, I haven't found faith like this, even among my fellow countrymen, even among Jewish people. That's amazing. Now, sometimes when we think, I, this is something, what do you call it, a pet peeve? I got a pet peeve. Uh, it's, it's worse than that. I'm really ticked off at people misapplying scripture like this. People misapply this and they say, well, I'm going to be like Jesus and I'm just going to speak my mind and I don't care what people... Oh, come off it. All you're doing is using religion as a license to be a jerk. Be quiet. You don't have anything good to say. Jesus is not just speaking his mind because he don't care about people. Jesus speaks his mind because he does care about people. He's bringing truth to bear on the situation. And he said, this is amazing. This Gentile and you people, he's talking to his fellow Jews, need to understand. And we see this from the rest of Christ. Just because you're physical descendants of Abraham doesn't mean you're right with God. You need to put your faith. We all do have to put our faith in Jesus Christ. And so here he is, and, and Jesus is trying to point the people, and it had to upset them. And it wasn't one of those things where he says, well, I don't care if they're upset. I'll be who I want to be. I've got to just be myself. No, that's not it. Jesus is not a jerk. Jesus spoke to them hard truth because they needed to hear because, and I think we're guilty of this in the United States sometimes too, are you a Christian? Yes. Why? Well, I'm an American. Or my parents went to church. Or maybe, I think my grandma went to Sunday school, so I think that makes me a Christian. No. We're not Christians just because we think our culture, which it isn't Christian, but we're not Christians just because we think our culture is Christian. We're not Christians just because mom and dad are Christians. And Jesus was saying, you guys aren't right with God just because you're physical descendants of Abraham. He says, I have not found such great faith even in Israel. Then the man uh, who had been sent returned to the, to the house, and they found the servant uh, healed. He was fine. The, the sickness had left him. There's only uh, that I could find. I tried to look. I read this, and I, and I wasn't quite sure, so I looked it up, and I... I couldn't find any other places. It, maybe it depends on which word you use, but only in two places in the New Testament does it say that Jesus is astounded or that he marveled or is surprised. Here at the faith of the Gentile centurion. Now, right away, people say, well, how can God be surprised if he's supposed to be God, right? Isn't that a fair question? Well, what we've been talking about ever since I studied the Gospels, we spoke about it last week, too, when Jesus was born as a baby, he needed his diaper changed. God, when he came out of heaven, this is true, he set aside his rights, his privileges as God. Uh, he, he had all the foreknowledge and ability he needed to accomplish his mission, but not more than that. And so this Gentile, this Gentile who is a, a godly man, a good man, who, who loved the people of Israel, he thought, uh, presumably he thought the God of Israel was the true God, 
and he helped them to build their local house of worship, he had total confidence in this prophet, this Jesus. He says, I know that if you say the word, my servant will be healed. And Jesus, the Bible says, he, he marveled. It was a joyful astonishment. Wow, look at the faith. I haven't seen this wonderful, powerful faith even among my own uh, countrymen. And then in Mark 6, he was astounded by the lack of faith shown by the people in his hometown of Nazareth. Uh, he went to his hometown. He says, you know what? Prophets have honor, but not in their hometown. Because everybody says, I remember when you were running down the block with a snotty nose. Or I wonder when you were chipped and you skinned your knee. Uh, prophets have honor, but not in their hometown. Uh, Mark 6, I'm reading out the Net Bible, uh, New English Translation. Now Jesus left that place and came to his hometown, Nazareth here. Remember we talked Nazareth, Bethlehem, Capernaum, all have kind of a right to call themselves a, a home base or hometown for Jesus. But Nazareth is where he grew up. And his disciples followed him. When the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue. Synagogue was the Jewish church, right? Many who heard him were astonished at his teaching, saying, Where did he get these ideas? And what is this wisdom that has been given to him? What are these miracles that are done through his hands? Because they grew up with him. It's a small town. Isn't this the carpenter, the son of Mary, and the brother of James, and Joseph, Judas, and Simon? Aren't his sisters right over there with us? And so... They took offense at him. Who does he think he is? Big deal, right? Isn't that human nature? They heard his teaching. They knew it was marvelous. They saw the miracles that he accomplished, but they're offended in their pride because they don't like somebody from their town to be a big deal. Then Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his hometown, and among his relatives and in his own house he has no honor there. He was not able to do a miracle there except to lay his hands on a few sick people and heal them and he was amazed because of their unbelief so we have jesus being amazed by the belief of the centurion and here he's amazed but not in a joyful way in a disappointed way about the unbelief of the people from his hometown then he went around among the villages in that region and taught some more so when christ sets aside his divine power and he comes to earth as a human being He's astonished by two things, lack of faith and faith. Well, doesn't that stir up within you a desire, God, I want you to find faith in my heart? God, I want you to find faith in my heart. Uh, that's convicting to me because I'm pretty talented at complaining. And when I complain, I know that's not faith. That's only looking at woe is me, look at all my problems, look at all my troubles. That's living a defeated life. There's no victory there. And I need to take my eyes off of myself and off of my problems and quit being so full of myself. And I need to start putting my eyes on Jesus Christ and his perfection, and his, his goodness. Faith pleases God. You know it? Do you know how I know this, other than the passage we just studied? Uh, faith pleases God. Hebrews 11, 6-10, without faith, it's impossible to please God. So that means faith pleases God. Without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists. But you know, that's not even enough because the Bible says even the demons believe and they shudder. Even demons know God's real, but that doesn't get them right with God. So you must believe that God is, exists, one, and two, you have to re believe that he, the Bible says, rewards those who earnestly seek him. That if I pursue God, that if I search for God, that if I bring God into my life, I believe that there's a blessing for that. I believe that being close to God is a blessing, and that pleases God. One, that you believe that he exists, and two, that you have, must believe. Let me, I'm just going to read the verse again. 11.6, without faith it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those, rewards those who earnestly seek him. Verse 7, by faith Noah, when warned about the things not yet seen, in holy fear built an ark to save his family. By faith he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness that is in keeping with faith. By faith Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as an inheritance, obeyed and went, 
even though he did not know where he was going. By faith, he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. For those, for he was looking forward to the city with foundations, whose architect and builder is God. Brothers and sisters, that's a big part of living by faith. This world, my, you know, I'm not just waking up and sucking air and going to work and coming home and eating something and going to sleep and doing this push repeat. I'm looking forward to a city whose foundations and architect and builder, whose foundations are created by the architect and builder God. We're looking for something, a better place. You ever feel like I'm not, I don't fit in here. This world's not for me. This, this world doesn't make sense. I don't, why am I here? I don't feel like it's because you were made for a better place. We were made for what God is calling us to. We're not supposed to sit around and say, oh, this is all there is? Well, that's all there should be. We're supposed to look around and say, there's something broken about this world. There's something messed up about this world. There's something messed up about me. And I'm looking for a better world. I'm looking for a better place. And by faith, we allow God to come into our lives and change us. So I know we're saved by faith, not by works. The Bible tells us this very clearly. There's nothing we can do that we could ever be good enough to deserve heaven. No one is good enough to stand before God and say, look at me, I'm all that. You are not good enough to stand before a holy God and say, take me as I am. If we get what, the, the silliest thing in the world is say, God, give me what I deserve. What do I deserve? Hell. What is hell? It's eternal separation from God. The Bible says all good things come from God. When I separate myself from him, I go to a dark place, don't I? What happens every time we turn our back on God? We go into a dark place. The light is behind us then. All we see in front of us is darkness. Because we're walking away from goodness and truth and beauty. So we're not saved by works. The Bible tells us in Genesis that Abraham believed God and that his faith in God was accounted unto him as righteousness. Faith is accounted unto him as righteousness. You know what that means? If you have faith in Jesus, God counts you as having rightness. Righteousness is rightness. In other words, when he sees you, he doesn't see your sin. He doesn't see your sin. That's why Romans 8, 1 says, There is therefore now no condemnation. No judgment for those who are in Christ Jesus. You, either, you have two choices in life. Take the penalty we all deserve. Yeah, I've lied. Yeah, I've, I've said some things I shouldn't. I've hurt some people that, that, that uh, I love. I've done some things I shouldn't have done. We either accept the penalty or we accept the forgiveness. We accept the grace. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So we're not, saved by, so we're not saved by works. We're saved by faith. Faith is counted as righteousness we did not have on our own. Why, why am I going over this again and again? Because our, our brain might get it, but our hearts tend not to. Our hearts tend to condemn us. <clears throat> our hearts tend to listen to Satan, who is the accuser of the brethren. And we live lives that we feel beat up and miserable all the time. When you put your faith in Jesus Christ... He gives us, he credits us, uh, credits us with righteousness that's not our own, that we don't even deserve. Paul talks about this in Romans chapter 4. What then shall we say that Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh, discovered in this matter? So he's talking to Gentiles. Uh, well, he's talking to Jews here who are, Abraham is their physical father, but he's also talking about Gentiles who are, are spiritual descendants of Abraham. If, in fact, Abraham was justified by works, then he had something to boast about, but not before God. Are you saved because of your works? Then go ahead and brag about it. I'm pretty good. But not before God, because he knows better. What does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Now to the one who works, wages are not credited as a gift, but as an obligation. You go to work, and your boss gives you a check, you, you don't feel like, wow, that's so wonderful that yeah, you gave me this present. No, you worked for it, you earn it, you deserve it, you get it. It's, it's an obligation. The boss has to pay you for the work that you give him. It's a transaction. However, 
the one who does not work but trusts in God, who justifies the ungodly. Their faith is credited to them as righteousness. Listen to this, God who justifies the ungodly. Well, what's a prerequisite for being saved? You've got to know that you're a sinner. You've got to know that you're ungodly. Because there's either righteousness from God or there's self-righteousness. What's self-righteousness? I don't need God because I'm pretty good by myself. That's the definition of self-rightness. So, so if I think I'm going to stand before God or I'm doing my life fine on my own, then we can't have the grace. To get the grace, we have to know that we're ungodly, that we need a Savior. It's like drowning in the water. I need a Savior, somebody in a boat who's not in my mess, somebody who can pull me out of this. <clears throat> Verse 6, David says the same thing when he speaks of the blessedness of one to whom God credits righteousness apart from works. Listen to this. Blessed are those whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. Now we know. Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord will never count against them. Blessed, remember, happy, lucky, is the person that God's not going to hold your sin against you. He's not going to hold his, your sin against you. What did Abraham do? He believed God. What was the result? His faith was credited to him as righteousness. Because he trusted God, God considered him to be without sin. He sees the perfect blood of Jesus Christ covering all of our sins. Now, I don't know if the centurion had saving faith. It seemed like he did in this passage. That's up to God to decide. I don't decide that. God decides who has saving faith, right? The centurion, though, did have faith that pleased Jesus. But God is not pleased with those who choose to turn away from him, who choose to turn their back on his offer of salvation. Hebrews 10, 38, 39 says, My righteous ones will live by faith, and I take no pleasure in the one who shrinks back. But we do not belong to those who shrink back and are destroyed, but to those who have faith and thus are saved. There's two categories of people, those who shrink back from faith and are thereby destined for destruction, and secondly, those who believe and they are destined, it's set in stone, to be saved. They have eternal life. Let's, let's uh, endeavor, as those of us who are saved by the blood of Jesus Christ, to please God by living faithful lives. And if you haven't placed your faith in Jesus Christ yet, I encourage you to do that. Get on your knees before holy God. Say, Lord, you're perfect. I'm not. I know I've messed up in so many ways. Thank you for that cross. Please forgive me. I want to live for you. I want to be part of your family. And then the Bible says God is pleased with faith. Let's live our lives in Christ with faith, not just to be saved, but let's live faithfully in the choices that we make, the way we live our lives, the way we treat other people. God's been so good to us, we should be good to one another. God's been so faithful to us, we should be faithful to one another. God's been so forgiving to us, we should forgive one another. God doesn't hold our sins against us, but he overlooks, he overlooks our transgressions. Brothers and sisters, Let's not keep a long list of one another's faults. That's a good way to ruin a relationship, isn't it? If God is willing to throw away the list of all Dan's faults, how can Dan turn around and hold a list of Bob's faults or Norman's faults? That's not right. That's not living faithfully. Let's please God. Let's endeavor to please the Lord, and thank you for his grace that... Uh, He's pleased with, uh, with our heart's effort, with the direction of our lives. Let's look at now at Luke 7, uh, 11 through 17. Soon afterward, this whole section with the centurion, Jesus went down to a town called Nain. You know what's weird? I've read my Bible so many times, and I thought, Nain? Where's that? What's that all about? Uh, I don't know why, but that had never uh, clicked in my, in my brain before, but uh, I guess it's about 40 minutes southwest uh, outside of Nazareth, about uh, uh, from Capernaum to, to Nain is about 40 minutes, and, and uh, Nain is about six miles outside of Nazareth. Uh, we're 
we're going to see Jesus do something that he's done quite often. Uh, God is the one who is, remember when he touched the leper? Remember when the woman uh, who is, had uh, blood issuing from her all those years uh, and she touched the hem of his cloth? Jesus is the one who comes near to people who are suffering and hurting. I want you to pay attention to that as we read these verses. Uh, soon afterward, Jesus went to a, a town called Nain, small town, and his disciples and a large crowd went along with him. So maybe there's probably more people traveling with him than in the town itself. As he approached the town gate, a dead person was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. And a large crowd from the town was with her. When the Lord saw her, his heart went out to her, and he said, don't wail. <laughs> the word for cry here is, is wailing, because there was a really loud uh, uh, remonstrating noise. It was a, is a, is a, like a, a howling uh, sadness. And, and when he sees them coming out, he sees the, the dead body, uh, his heart went out to this woman who's a widow. Now listen, there's widows all over the world, and there's moms who have lost their little boys and little girls. Isn't it amazing to think that God in heaven sees and he has compassion and his heart goes out to those moms? God puts on flesh comes down into the human world, and he doesn't say, oh yeah, I transcend time, I've seen billions of deaths, ho-hum. He doesn't. God, is, even though he's created all of these galaxies with all these trillions, trillions of stars that are just like our sun, he feels compassion on us. We're not like, it's not like you're walking on bugs. He comes down and resides alongside of us, and his heart is moved. He knows our pain. And he says to the woman, don't cry. Don't cry. Then he went up and touched the uh, bear where, he was, where they were carrying on. Maybe it says coffin. So he goes up there and touches this, and the, and the bear is stood still. When he does that, guess what? He made himself ritually unclean in, in, uh, in uh, Jewish uh, ritual uh, worship. But Jesus didn't care. He didn't care about religion. He cared about bringing comfort. He cared about saying, I'm with you. So he goes up there. He didn't have to. We just saw that Jesus can heal from a distance, right? That's the way he feel, healed the centurion servant. Jesus could have said, hey, you guys over there, don't cry. Jump. And the guy would have jumped right off of that, popped right off, started doing a jig. But Jesus comes over there, and he's with the people in this sorrow. And you know what? Maybe he was even thinking about his own death. I'm going to die, and all of you can be saved, and there will be eternal life for everyone who will come to me in faith because I'm going to kick death. Jesus Christ not only defeats our sin at the cross, he defeats death at the cross. That's why he came, and he came so that we could have new life and have a relationship with him. God cares. I said we're going to get a glimpse into the heart and mind of God. We have a God who cares. A God who is full of compassion. God sees our trouble. God sees. And God cares. Then he went up, verse 14, he touched the bear where they were carrying him on and the bear stood still. He said, young man, isn't that beautiful? Young man, not just hey you. Young man, I say to you, get up. The man sat up and began to talk. And Jesus gave him back to his mother, which is a beautiful picture. This is God bestowing a gift, giving back the son to the mother. They were all filled with awe and praised God. A great prophet has appeared among us, they said. God has come to help his people. That's how we should respond when we learn about Jesus Christ. God has come to help his people. God came to help me. Because I need it. This news about Jesus spread throughout Judea and the surrounding country. Jesus touches the coffin, and you know what? Our sin makes us de dead to God. The filthiness that comes out of our mouth, the thoughts that are in our brain, the addictions we have, our pride, our anger, our impatience. You think Jesus doesn't want anything to do with you? He will come right into the disgustingness of our messed up life and he will touch us. 
He will put his hands right in the middle of the situation because he cares, because he has compassion, and Jesus has compassion on me, and Jesus has compassion on you, and Jesus has compassion on you, and it doesn't matter what death our life is filled with, what misery our life is filled with, what sin our life is filled with. He will come right in there because of love. Now, two weeks ago, I said, my God is an alien. Remember that sermon? My God is an alien. Because he says he's totally alien things. He says, love your enemies. What's wrong with you? He says, I know better than you. Shut up and do it. <laughs> he says, bless those who curse you. He said, no, when people curse me, I want to curse them out. I want to respond in kind. I want to go right down to their level. And Jesus says, no, because I bless people who don't deserve it. I want you to bless people who don't deserve it. I want you to speak goodness into their life. I want you to be a blessing to them. I want you to speak grace and truth and beauty into their life. My God is an alien. I'm so glad he's not like me. Aren't you glad that God's not like you? That he's so good and beautiful and he gives us something to aspire and he says, be like me. And I said, thank you because I don't want to be like me. I want to be like you. God is an alien. But guess what? It's possible to take that thinking too far, and I've heard people do that, especially for some reason, uh, atheists. But, but I think we Christians do it too. And we think, well, God's so great, he doesn't care about me. Or why would God listen to my prayers? I've messed up so many times. Or, or God wouldn't care about me. And I've heard atheists say, Christians are so arrogant. Look at the size of the universe. If there is a God, he wouldn't care about you. And I say, you know this because... Like, how do you know this? And why do you feel free to speak for God? When we have, again, what we said, if love is the center of the universe, don't be surprised if God gives us a love letter. He showed us his, he's shown us his heart, and God cares. And he wants you to know that he cares. So we can take this idea of God is other too far and think that God is so exalted, he's, he's so cosmic, that we're less than ants to him, that God doesn't care, God wouldn't care if our whole planet disappeared, God doesn't care what happens in my life, he would never care about us. You know what? You are severely, severely underestimating the love of God. God loves with a divine love. It's a big love. It's big enough to love even ants who mess up. And he says to these messed up ants who are so arrogant and full of pride, I'm going to make you children, and I want to bring you into my family, and I love you and I bless you. I'm even, to come, I'm even to come down and live life alongside you and take responsibility for all the things you've done wrong. Thinking that God doesn't care exaggerates our sin and diminishes God's grace and diminishes his love. God knows our sin better than we know ourselves, and he still is mad in love with you. God knows everything, and he doesn't want to send you away. He wants to bring you into his family. <coughs> That's why he died for us. God created you and I to have a relationship with him. He created the human race to commune with us. He came to earth to live alongside of us. Hebrews 4.15 says, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses. We're talking about Jesus Christ. We don't have a high priest who's unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way just like we are, yet he didn't sin because he's perfect and he's wonderful. And I want to adore him. I want to praise him. I want to be close to him. There's no place I'd rather be than close to Jesus. Well, my flesh is always trying to run away. But you know that part that God's put in me, the new man? want to be close to Jesus. What's in God's heart? Well, it's compassion. Compassion. And he's pleased with faith. That's in God's heart. He cares. And you know what? What do we see today? God wants us to trust him. God wants us to live lives as if we actually trust him. Not just checking a box saying, I believe in Jesus and I do as I please. God says, trust me with that aspect of your life. Trust me with this aspect of your life. But I'm so angry at my husband. Can't let it go. He said, live a life of faith. Trust me. Trust me. But I can't stand this person or that person anymore. I died for that person. 
I love them. Are you going to trust me in this? Trust me. Brothers and sisters, uh, let's pray and let's ask God to stir up within us faith. Lord, we believe. Help our unbelief. Let's pray. Lord God, here we are. We're here because we want to trust you. We believe. And yet, Lord, we're so weak. Father, help us to live lives of victory. Please strengthen us with your Holy Spirit, Lord. Please give us direction. Please draw us close to your side. Lord, uh, we want to walk so close behind you that you were covered with your dust. We want to be so close to your face that we can feel your breath on our faces, Lord. Lord, uh, thank you that you give us credit for being righteous, even though technically we're very far from that. But you give us credit for being righteous when we reach out to you in faith, Lord. Thank you. God, I want to pray for myself, all my wonderful brothers, all my wonderful sisters. Help us to truly live lives of faith. Help us to make decisions based upon faith in you. Lord, let our actions be based upon faith in you. Thank you, God, for loving us. Help us, Lord, to really love the people around us. We pray this in your name. Amen. Thank you for watching. Foundation TV is a ministry of Foundation Bible Church, Janesville, Wisconsin. Find us online at foundationbiblechurch.com. Foundation Bible Church, inconveniently located two blocks northwest of the Janesville Athletic Club.